Good evening. With every hour, it's becoming more apparent that one of the most pristine coastlines in the world has been fouled in a way that may never be undone. And with every hour, there is more anger aimed at Exxon. The oil company's corporate responsibility, or lack of it, is the focus of Tony Russomano's report tonight. Tony? Anna, the Alaskan oil spill is a testament to indecision and folly, and to too much faith in technology, and too little respect for nature. This is the sound of the call of the wild now in Alaska. The plaintive cry of a seabird dying of exposure in Prince William Sound. Its feathers are coated with oil, no longer able to provide the natural insulation that would protect the bird's body from the cold. Other birds are dead or dying, not only from exposure, but from poisoning, as they ingest oil while trying to preen the glop from their feathers. The sea otter's fur is the most valuable on Earth, but the oil that rendered this otter's fur worthless now dooms the animal to death. It will die without knowing what is happening to it or why. A group of 100 otters is presumed dead after biologists saw them swim into oil-infested waters and disappear. Otters near shore will die on land, but those in the water will sink and never be found, their bodies weighted down by oil. Underwater marine life, fish and crabs may also die by the millions. While Exxon would like to blame the entire disaster on one man, Exxon Valdez Captain Joseph Hazelwood, there are many who have shown a lack of good sense and judgment. Here are a dozen examples of the folly. First, when the ship ran aground, an unlicensed third mate was at the helm. Second, when a Coast Guardsman came aboard following the accident, Captain Hazelwood was found to be not just drunk, but actually still drinking, according to a National Transportation Safety Board investigator. We're all extremely disappointed and outraged that an officer in such a critical position would have jeopardized his ship, crew, and the environment through such actions. Third in the list of follies, it took more than 12 hours for the first spill containment equipment to reach the ship, more than seven hours longer than emergency plans called for. Fourth, an Alieska Pipeline Company cleanup barge was in dry dock for repairs, and the company had failed to notify the state as required. Fifth, Exxon officials turned down or did not respond to immediate offers of help from other companies, other states, and other nations. Help that would have included exactly the type of cleanup equipment that was needed. Sixth, indecision and delays stalled the containment effort on Saturday and Sunday when the spill was still covering only a relatively small area. Seventh, high winds Monday whipped the oil into a froth, spreading it beyond the capability of oil booms to contain it and rendering Exxon's decision to use a chemical dispersant useless. Eighth, Exxon's second line of defense, attempting to ignite the oil with lasers and napalm gel, also failed miserably. Ninth, Exxon falsely reported that a cleanup of beaches was already underway on Wednesday, even though we could clearly see for ourselves that was not true. Exxon later apologized for misleading everyone. Tenth, no workers were being hired to help with the cleanup, even though experts said the job required 500 boats and 10,000 people. The cleanup will require lots of hard manual labor and lots of people. That, ironically, may bring a new boom to Valdez as job seekers migrate here over the next several months to help with this job. The 11th folly takes us back to the construction of the Exxon Valdez. It was built with only a single hull in order to save money. Maybe they should have known something was wrong when they christened her. And finally, Exxon's decision to get rid of at least nine senior staff oil spill experts, again to save money. The 1986 cutbacks included Exxon's chief environmental officer and left the company with less experienced oil spill professionals. And that's far from a complete list. We also have to ask why the Coast Guard cut back on the distance they track tankers by radar in Prince William Sound, why the Alyeska Pipeline Company eliminated its entire crew of 20 full-time professionally trained cleanup experts. Twelve years ago, when the first tanker steamed out of Valdez, the oil companies boasted of a high-tech operation that would be, in their words, the safest in the world. They just couldn't make good on their promise. Anna? The spill continues to spread uh, at this hour. It's, it's now covering an area greater than that of the state of Rhode Island. It is by far the largest oil spill in the history of North America. For three hours, we flew over the hardest hit islands in Prince William Sound and saw none of the 600 workers Exxon claims are on shore cleaning up the coastline. The endless circling was a double embarrassment to Exxon. Not only has the company already apologized once for falsely reporting a cleanup was underway last week, Today's flight was paid for by Exxon and offered to the news media precisely to show off the cleanup workers who were not there. Instead, what we did see were hundreds of miles of coastline still heavily coated with oil.
coves where the oil has formed deep, stagnant, tarry black pools and more than a thousand square miles of open water laced with long, skinny tentacles of brown, foaming crude. The oil that's causing the problem now has changed into a consistency the scientists call chocolate mousse. In this entire region, there's said to be only one vessel capable of cleaning up chocolate mousse spills, and this is it. Then what, you may ask, is it doing here on land and not out on Prince William Sound where it can do some good? Well, the owner of this vessel says, ask Exxon. Exxon, a $5 billion a year corporation, has offered nothing but excuses when it comes to stopping the oil. But eight teenagers from an isolated fishing village are now attempting to do what Exxon won't even try protecting the extremely valuable fish hatcheries at Sawmill Bay. The 16 and 17 year old high school students are part of a group of 38 villagers from Cordova who formed a mosquito fleet of fishing boats to head out on their own to make a stand against the oil. It's so sad that um, we can do this to our environment, but we can kill poor animals that they don't know what's going on. It's sad. <laughs> Poor bird, <laughs> kind of, kind of caught in a world he doesn't know what to do. Can't, doesn't have the brains to get away from the oil. It is backbreaking work. A bunch of kids against all that oil, and it is heartbreaking work to see the faces of children young enough to still believe they can change the world, but old enough to know they are witnessing the destruction of their heritage. The teenagers are being housed on a ferry owned by the state. Fishing is so vital to this area that these students are majoring in fish at Cordova High School. Their academic program was quickly altered to give them school credit for this four-day tour. The students' teachers are hoping that those who are now learning from Exxon's mistakes will find they are not doomed to repeat them. The Exxon Valdez is to be refloated on Wednesday. They've uh, pumped a lot of the oil off, but there will still be between 60, between 30 and 60,000 barrels of oil on board the Valdez, the Exxon Valdez, when they do start to refloat it on Wednesday. Anna? Any idea when there's going to be a truly massive volunteer cleanup effort or cleanup effort on those coastlines that were uninhabited today in those pictures? Well, you know, I, uh, there was somebody from Exxon with me on the helicopter when I was out today, and I said, hey, what's going on here? You, you took us out in this helicopter to see the cleanup effort. It was supposed to be your PR department organizing this, and there's nobody out here. We were traveling, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of miles of coastline, and there's nobody there, and yet you say there are people out here. Well, the explanation I got coming out of the helicopter was just incredulous, was, well, we don't have anybody out there now because we're afraid of bears. We think the bears might eat the cleanup people. Well, we've heard that before, and in fact, it's a real concern. The area is being so remote that only skilled wilderness campers are even uh, comfortable out there or safe out there. What are they going to do? Well, I, you know, they haven't done anything yet, I can tell you that. What are they going to do? I don't know. Uh, the, the fishermen have taken the matters into, into their own hands. Uh, the state is, uh, is putting a lot of pressure on, on Exxon and supporting the fishermen and telling the fishermen, go out and do whatever it is you need to be done, spend whatever money needs to be spent, and we will get that money back from Exxon. The state's making that assurance to the fishermen. Thank you. Tony Russomano reporting live from the tainted Port of Valdez. The Tony Russomano joins us now with the latest from Alaska. Tony? Anna, Exxon's uh, cleanup of the oil spill is being called a fraud. Blunt language from Congressman George Miller of Contra Costa County. Miller is the chairman of the House Subcommittee on uh, Offshore Oil, the congressional agency that has oversight for the Alaska pipeline and offshore oil. He made his comments today after visiting one of the remote villages of Prince William Sound and seeing for himself what Alaskans have been saying pretty much for, the, for almost the past two weeks now, that Exxon's uh, management of the, uh, of the cleanup uh, really isn't, uh, isn't what it should be. In fact, it's close to zero. Representative Miller said what Exxon really is managing is a failure. Cleanup plan that was filed before the accident is just turning out to be a fraud. It was just, it, it simply existed only on paper. It didn't exist in fact. Contra Costa Representative George Miller toured Chenega Bay in a skiff accompanied by several state officials and one dead sea otter. Poor bastard, he can't even die in there. just eating crabs and enjoying life. Yeah, it was. Fishermen volunteers are managing to hold their own 
in a non-stop battle to save the salmon hatcheries of Sawmill Bay. But Exxon's contribution to the effort is dead in the water. Mm. Out there in the distance is the Exxon cleanup operation. It's not going very well at all because they have no way of pumping the heavy crude oil off of the skimmers. The state and the volunteer fishermen here might have had the same problem, but they found a guy on the north slope with three big truck-mounted vacuum units. They called him up and said, start driving, we can use them. He got here, put the, put the trucks on the barge, and it's working. This is the oil that's been skimmed from the surface of the water by the volunteers. It's being collected in a barge. Eventually, it will be reprocessed at a refinery and may end up heating your home. But the recovered oil represents only about 4% of the total spill. The rest is destroying habitat and wildlife. You know, it's predation, so it's going up the food chain. The heads are getting eaten off. And then, when I was walking around, I heard an eagle up in the top of a tree that was uh, squeaking and hawking, you know, and I'm afraid that it's, that it's just really sad. You know, it's just it's devastating the whole sound. Beyond the toll on animals, Alaska's subsistence people are afraid of starvation. They're the residents of remote villages who depend on local fish and wildlife for survival. Money cannot buy everything. We don't have stores here. Uh, so the dependence on, on the local resources is very strong. Also today, the governor of Alaska asked the state, asked the Coast Guard to take over management of the oil spill cleanup because of uh, Exxon's failures. Joining me now is Congressman George Miller of Contra Costa County. Uh, Congressman, you're going to be speaking to the, uh, to the anchors back in the station, but first I'd like to ask you if, if uh, the reality of what you saw here today matches in any way what you heard in, in Washington in the lower 48 before you came out. No, I don't think it does at all, Tony. I think what we've seen is that uh, we've been given assurances that Exxon had the capability both to clean up the oil and to manage the, uh, the cleanup. And I just saw no evidence of that today after spending the entire day out on Prince William Sound. There's just, there's just no evidence that they have any ability uh, to meet this disaster. And in fact, it, it may be that it's already too far gone that anybody uh, can get control of it at this stage. And I think the governor's made a wise decision by asking the Coast Guard for help and to come in and take this over. Tony Russomano is just back from Alaska to bring us the latest on the wreck of the Valdez and the reaction from the disaster area. On a part of the story is about responsibility, both the personal and the corporate kind. We're hearing about the captain's drinking and Exxon is now saying the disaster was caused by human error. But Exxon isn't saying much anymore about its own responsibility, which, as we'll see, appears to be growing more and more substantial. And of course, while they argue about responsibility on shore in Valdez, an entire marine ecosystem on, is on the verge of being wiped out. The waters of Prince William Sound no longer splash ashore. They flap like a heavy, wet blanket. The oil is several inches thick in places on Eleanor Island. A once pristine wilderness is now an ecological disaster. This bird never had a chance. This is a comorant, a seabird that gets its food by diving under the surface for fish. It could have picked up the oil after going under after a tender morsel of food and coming up in the middle of the spill. And it probably died of poisoning after trying to clean itself by licking its feathers to get rid of the oil. This disaster was in the making even before the Exxon Valdez was christened. Indeed, even the christening did not go right. Unlike many other tankers, the Valdez was built without a protective double bottom hull. Exxon said it was trying to save money. We were thinking, well, if uh, it ever were to run aground and, and be punctured, uh, that uh, the oil will spill out. But uh, once we knew that other nations are doing it and that it's legal here in the United States to do it, we went on and, and built it, and we were proud to build it. A single bottom hull was not the only money-saving decision Exxon made. At least nine oil spill experts, including Exxon's senior environmental officer, were given early retirements in 1986 and not replaced in a company-wide economy move. But the major focus of the Alaska spill involves the events of the past week, beginning at 9.30 last Thursday night. The Exxon Valdez departs with Captain Joseph Hazelwood on the bridge and pilot Ed Murphy responsible for taking the ship through Valdez Narrows. 11.24 p.m., the ship is in the tanker lane and the pilot leaves. His job is done. At some point after that, Captain Hazelwood goes below deck and third mate Gregory Cousins assumes control. Cousins is not licensed to skipper the vessel in the sound. 11.39 p.m., the ship receives Coast Guard permission to change course to avoid an ice flow. 11.55 p.m., Exxon Valdez hits a jagged rock pinnacle 50 feet below the surface. 
The ship is a quarter mile outside the shipping lanes. Rocks punch three six-foot holes in two tanks. Third mate Cousins struggles to return the ship to the lanes. But nine minutes later, at 12.04 a.m. Friday, the ship broadsides Bly Reef and runs aground. A rock 28 feet below the surface rips the keel from bow to stern. Eight of the ship's 13 tanks rupture. Divers later find at least 10 huge holes in the hull, up to 20 feet in diameter. At least 6 million gallons of oil gush through the holes within the first several minutes, and the ship continues leaking about 20,000 gallons per hour. It is now 1228 Friday morning. The ship first notifies the Coast Guard it has run into a reef, 33 minutes after initial impact. More than 12 hours later, Friday afternoon, the ship is still without help. An Alieska Pipeline Company cleanup barge that was supposed to have been dispatched immediately is instead in dry dock. The company admits it violated cleanup plans by failing to tell the state the barge was disabled. Friday night, an oil slick covers 30 square miles and contains 11 and one half million gallons of crude. Oil containment booms are too few and far between. Day two, Saturday. Current spread the slick into an expanding blot fouling nearby beaches. The first wildlife is found dead. Day three, Sunday. The slick now covers 100 square miles in the shape of a crooked tier. Day four, Monday. The spill, whipped by high winds, spoils beaches on several islands as it's blown southwest like a 40-mile-long spear. Day five, Tuesday. Local fishermen, fed up with Exxon's failures, set out on their own to protect the waters where millions of young salmon are about to make their way to the sea. The fishermen set up containment booms to turn the estuaries around Main Bay and San Juan Bay into fortresses against the oily invasion. A sheet of tar several inches thick washes up on Eleanor Island, 35 miles from the Exxon Valdez. Day 6, Wednesday. The spill now covers nearly 600 square miles, or roughly twice the area of San Francisco Bay. The slick is headed toward the Montague Strait, an outlet to the Gulf of Alaska. Government biologists cite 136 sea lions trapped on oil-encircled Smith Island. 100 sea otters disappear in the oil and are presumed dead. Killer whales are seen swimming through the slick. The state urges Exxon to mount a massive effort of boats and manpower to clean up the spill. A former NASA environmental health director says it would take at least 500 boats and 10,000 people. Eventually, the oil will degenerate into a thick foam. It will have to be raked up by hand and put into containers. On rocky shores like this, high-pressure hoses can be used to blast the oil back to the water where it can be picked up by skimmers. But eventually, people are going to have to kneel down at each rock and scrub them by hand. We thought we'd leave you with a couple of seconds of a very unnatural sound in some pristine wilderness, what once was pristine. What's next? Well, the oil is still moving southwest to the Gulf of Alaska. If it continues its present course, the slick could hit Kodiak and devastate fish hatcheries and the fishing industry there. Anna? In just a few moments, we'll be telling you what is going on right now among conservationists who are going to have to deal with that cleanup. But also, Tony, I wanted to ask you about reports earlier today that a Coast Guard employee was found to have had a blood alcohol level of 0.2, a man, a civilian, who was in the radar room. Now there are questions about why the Coast Guard didn't warn the tanker. That's right, but it's very important to point out that that blood alcohol a reading was taken several hours after the uh, Coast Guard civilian employee went off duty. He was on duty from midnight till 8 a.m., stayed a few hours after 8 a.m. He was called back into the office for a blood alcohol test in mid-afternoon and was then found to, uh, to have alcohol in his system. He denied drinking on duty, and people who were working with him at the time said he was capable and did not show any signs of intoxication. So at this point, the major focus is the captain of the ship. And, and Exxon. And Exxon. Thank you, Tony. What the Exxon oil slick is still spreading, and as Tony Russomano shows us, no one knows how far the contamination will go. The long-term effects of the Valdez oil spill are beyond the ability of marine biologists to forecast. So Prince William Sound has been turned into a vast scientific experiment, with researchers and lab equipment pouring into the area to learn as much as they can. Amid the incalculable losses, the only thing that may be salvaged is knowledge. We had a pristine environment here. People don't like to hear me say pristine, but that's what it was. It was a northern Eden, okay? And somebody's let the genie out of the bottle. 
and now we've got the only thing we can gain out of it is our science. But science will not put food on the table or pay the bills for those who have lived here in a delicate balance with nature. It breaks our heart. It, the words couldn't even tell you the sadness. It's just horrible. It's like a war. Only, you know, it's not people that are dying. It's, it's, a, it's our whole life. It's our world. Jane Cotter and her family had been getting two meals a day fishing in Prince William Sound. But even the family's youngest member knows their lives have now changed. When do you think you'll be able to fish again? Um, probably when I'm 10 or something. And how old are you now? Five. Valdez has been called a one-company town, and it's true that everyone here either works for the pipeline, makes money off of other people who work for the pipeline, or are somehow affected by the pipeline. And no industry is affected more right now than the fishing industry and the hatcheries, which stand to lose hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of the spill. These are salmon fry, newly hatched pink salmon being transferred from their hatchery incubators to outdoor ponds. It's already past the time in these young salmon's lives when they must be imprinted in fresh water, a little understood biological function that gives the fish the memory of where they were hatched so they can return to this exact spot to spawn and be captured by commercial fishermen for the world's food supply. Later this spring, hundreds of millions of salmon fry must be released to head out to salt water. Hatchery experts and biologists say they just don't know whether the fish will make it this year. The fry have an ability to avoid the hydrocarbon areas because they have such an acute sense of smell, but they won't uh, necessarily avoid the contaminated plankton because the plankton drift around with the tides and may not be they may have taken up hydrocarbons in a heavy affected area, but then not be present in that area when they're eaten. Paul McCullough manages a hatchery within sight of the Alyeska pipeline terminal. The oil spill could cost his hatchery alone up to $20 million this year. He says he blames himself and everyone else in Valdez for not paying more attention to the gradual reduction in safety procedures surrounding the terminal operation. Everyone, he says, had been real happy just to see all that money coming in. In Valdez, Tony Russomano, Channel 7 News. We switched lot. He's threatened to shut down the Alaska oil pipeline. Tony Russomano is just back from Alaska. Tony, do you think he really means it? He is dead serious. You know, uh, Alaska is a, is a frontier state where people mean exactly what they say. Because in the Arctic, your own survival often depends on the, re uh, on the reliability of what you're told. Well, Exxon and Alyeska promised the people of Alaska that the pipeline would not cause a problem, and that promise was broken. Uh, Yukon pioneer poet uh, Robert Service once wrote, a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. Well, Exxon and Alyeska may not practice that code, but they understand it, and they know the governor's not bluffing. You know, it was so striking a difference in opinion. You with Congressman George Miller from the East Bay telling us that Exxon's cleanup was a fraud, and yet just a few days before that, the president's task force saying it looked like everything was under control. How could they have both been at the same place at the same time and, and come up with that? Exactly the point. They weren't at the same place. One person was on, uh, was on shore back in Valdez, uh, talking to officials, traveling around in cars, meeting, uh, meeting other people. The other guy, Congressman Miller, jumped in a 13-foot skiff and, and took off for, uh, for Chenega Bay and, and got down with the, with the fishermen, the, the people who were, who were doing the cleanup, and saw for himself exactly what was going on. You know, I think if there was, if there was one moment in this, in this entire episode in which everything turned, it was when Congressman Miller was on this skiff traveling around in Chenega Bay, and he had seen uh, the fishermen working, he had seen uh, the, the oil, he had seen the Exxon cleanup tanker that was dead in the water. It wasn't working because it was, uh, it was missing a part. The oil had, had literally clogged it. And at his feet in this skiff was a, was a dead sea otter. And finally, all of it came together for him. And he just, at one point, stood up and turned to me and he said, it's a fraud. It's all a big fraud. You know, so many times we have seen the story of three otters at SeaWorld in San Diego, and the implication is that thousands of animals, not just marine animals, but thousands of animals are dying and there's no hope of getting to them. They're only able to recover very few of the animals. Most of the sea otters are sinking, are dying and sinking. The ones they can recover are the ones that are, uh, that are well enough to uh, be given a chance to survive, yet sick enough to be, to be slow enough for the rescuers to catch them, if, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And even those that are, that are brought in for, um, for recovery, uh, it, the, the chances aren't, aren't very good at all. Only, only about half of the otters that are, that are brought in are, um, are recovering. But the thing to keep in mind, as far as the fishermen are concerned, 
um, they don't like the otters. They, they're, they're happy that, that the otters are going because the otters are competing with them. We have a, a much different view of it. We see a, a cute furry animal with big brown eyes and the, and the fishermen see competition. But the fact is the, uh, the animal rescue is not rescuing hundreds and hundreds of, of birds and animals. Many, many thousands are dying. And beyond that, the damage to the habitat, beyond the damage to the animals, the, the animal's habitat is really serious and that's going to suffer. I spoke today with the Lieutenant Governor of Alaska and he said that there was a sense not only of anger, but betrayal. And it, it has to be that, that they ex many people enjoy the benefits of having Exxon there, and yet now they have to really wonder whether or not it was worth it. Well, I think the people of Alaska do believe, in a sense, that they, they did bring this on themselves for not being careful enough, for not watching Alyeska, and for being too trusting. It was just too easy to accept the money and not ask a lot of questions. Tony, welcome home. You did a terrific job, and I know you put in marathon hours. We Thanks. appreciate Good it. Good to be back. You're welcome. Thank you.